Thank you, guys. So what are some things that you struggle to understand? Um, there's a number of lists on the internet of things that are hard to understand, and I thought I'd share a few of those with you. Why are there interstate highways in Hawaii? How does the guy who drives a snowplow get to work in the mornings? Why do they put braille dots on the keypad of the drive-up ATM? Why do we drive on parkways and park on driveways? Why is it that when you transport something by car, it's called shipment, but when you transport something by ship, it's called cargo? Why does your nose run and your feet smell? If pro is the opposite of con, is progress the opposite of Congress? Why do kamikaze pilots wear helmets? If it's tourist season, why can't we shoot them? <laughs> Isn't it a bit unnerving that doctors call what they do practice? There was another list that I saw and it said things that make no sense. How easily people convince themselves that they know more about a topic than an expert who has devoted their life to a topic after a 10 minute Google search. People wanting flying cars. With as many bad drivers as there are on the ground, why would you want that in the sky? I still have no idea how phones and computers work. I've had it explained to me so many times, but I'm totally fine just being in awe of how cool it all is. Then the last one, that my spouse cannot close anything completely. Everything is halfway screwed on or has just the top sitting on it. <laughs> some of you are laughing too hard. That must be some some truth to some of those things. You know, some of these things uh, are not that important to understand. Most of those things on that list, your life will not depend upon whether or not you can understand that. Other things are, are really helpful to understand. How to cook, um, how to study for a test, how to drive a car, a number of things like that are, are very helpful to understand. But, you know, one thing is crucial to understand, and that's how to receive God's forgiveness and eternal life. And that's why we spend this time every Sunday morning opening God's Word to hear what God has to tell us about those things that are so important to understand. So as we continue in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is teaching through, um, through the use of parables. He's, he's no longer just teaching plainly, and much of that is because of the rejection from the religious leaders that they have uh, decided not only to not listen to him, not apply the truth to their lives, but they've even begun to plot how to kill him. And so he's veiling the truth by using these parables. Well, what's a parable? Uh, I said last week it's a simple story to teach spiritual truth. So this morning he's going to continue with some parables as we turn to Mark chapter 4, verse 21. So if you have your Bibles, why don't you turn there and you can follow along. Let me give you a little bit of background or context. Last week, Jesus explained why he taught using parables, to both conceal the truth from those who refuse to accept it and to reveal the truth, uh, reveal more truth, in fact, to those who are willing to not only accept it but to act upon it. And the, the thought here that is very clear as this gospel is unfolding is that some people refuse to believe no matter how much evidence is shown. Jesus' miracles, his healing, his casting out demons, his fulfilling prophecy were all evidences of who he was. And they were sufficient evidences. They were sign markers. They were pointers helping people understand that this just wasn't a man. This wasn't just another rabbi. This wasn't just a prophet. But these things gave evidence of who he truly was and is. Kind of reminds me of that saying, my mind's made up, don't confuse me with the facts. You ever met people like that? Or maybe sometimes we fall into that, that we have our minds so made up, no matter what we hear, no matter what we're taught, we're, we're stuck where we are. And as we look at this passage starting in, in verse 21, 
one of the things that we can learn is we can depend upon God to increase our understanding of his word as we carefully listen to it and put it into practice in our life. Two things there, that as we listen to it, meaning intently listen to make application, and then we actually take that application and we put it to practice in our lives. In verse 21 of Mark 4, Jesus said, it says, He also said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed? Isn't it to be put on a lampstand? For there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed, and nothing concealed that will not be brought to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him listen. He's giving another example, whether or not you'd strictly call this a parable or maybe a metaphor. He's telling us that God's truth is like a lamp, and we've seen that uh, in other places in Scripture, like in Psalms where it talks to us about uh, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Well, just as a lamp is intended to illumine a room by showing what is there, so also God's truth, though hidden from some at the time, is intended to bring to light what's true. Um, the idea of a lamp back in those days, you, you can see it on the next slide. It, there's a little picture of it. Um, keep going. There it is. Some would say that's like a terracotta pot. They'd put oil in it, um, and then there'd be a wick, and they'd light it, and usually there'd be a stand somewhere in the house to put that to illumine the room, or sometimes there'd be little shelves along the wall where they, they'd put that, and it would light up the whole room, and that would be something that would be very familiar to the people of that time. And the idea here is that God's Word is like that. It's like a lamp. It's like a light. It, it illuminates things. It shows us what's there. And in this case, the truth about Jesus, though concealed at this point in his ministry, was to be revealed later and one day will be acknowledged by all. I don't know if you've even thought about that, but today there's a lot of people that don't recognize who Jesus is. There are a lot of people, and in fact, it seems like more and more in our culture, there are skeptics saying things like Jesus is is a good teacher, or Jesus is a, a religious leader, but not the Son of God. But Philippians 2, 9 through 11 makes it really clear that one day the identity of Jesus Christ will be known to all. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says, For this reason God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Can you imagine that? that? That today, sometimes you feel like you're in the minority because you understand who Jesus is, that he's Lord. And, and, and that he is one day going to show that to the entire world and that it won't be just Christians, but every knee will bow. They won't be bowing because they believe in him and they trust in him and they've, they've come to uh, have him as their Lord. They're going to be forced to bow because he's going to show himself in power and in glory. So when we put our faith in Jesus Christ and begin to live out the truth, we grow in our ability to hear and understand. And part of this is what I talked about last week, that, that you, the more you understand the more you put into practice, the more you live out, the more you share with others, the more you'll receive. And, and when we refuse to do that, Jesus said, even the little that you have will be taken away. The question here is, do you have ears to hear? I haven't checked everybody, but I think everybody has ears here. Um, but the question is, do you have the kind of ears that are ready to listen? that are ready to hear God's word and to put it into practice. You know, it wasn't until I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ at age 19 that the Bible began to really come alive to me. And I could sense God speaking to me through his word. I remember the very first time I went to this one youth group that I was invited to, uh, it was, I was in college, I was college students, and we were studying 1 Thessalonians. I was just amazed that the word could come alive and speak to me 
personally. Because you see, I, I grew up in a church all, all my life, and, and I was taught the Bible, and you know, we went through stuff in Sunday school, and I knew the stories, but it wasn't the same. Once I got serious about my faith and I surrendered my life to Christ and I basically said, God, whatever you want, whatever you want to do, that's what I want to do. All of a sudden, things started making sense. God's word started coming alive. I don't know if you've had that happen. If not, I, I pray that you will, that you'll get to that point in your life where you'll not only be hungry to hear, but you'll be eager to do. And God will open that door and begin to illumine his word to you. In verses 24 and 25, we see that being given understanding into God's truth depends on how you'll receive it. Verse 24 says, And he said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. By the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and more will be added to you. For whoever has, more will be given to him, and whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. When I first read that, I thought, boy, that doesn't sound fair. You know, that doesn't sound like, um, you know, capitalism and all that kind of stuff. It just, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't sound fair at all. But it's not talking about welfare checks. It's not talking about money. It's not talking about social security payments. It's, it's talking about God's truth, that, that we're responsible for what we receive. And this morning in the adult Sunday school class, we were talking about the the soil and the seeds, and we're talking about the whole fact that sometimes people receive it and it bears fruit, and other times it doesn't go anywhere. Well, this is kind of the same idea here. He, he's repeating this, but now uh, with some uh, different words. And the thought is that we need to pay close attention to the truth of God's Word that we read and hear, that we're responsible to put it into practice in our lives. I remember when I was a teenager, there were some things that my mom and I didn't agree upon, and so she gave me a, a couple of articles that were like Bible studies, and I can't even remember what, what we were talking about. What I do remember is I didn't want to read them. And you know why I didn't want to read them? I figured if I read those things, then I would be responsible and I would have no excuse. It was almost like, you know, you, I don't know if you've ever done this in an argument. You ever do this with your kids or, or maybe with your spouse and you go, can't hear you, can't hear you, you ever do that? <laughs> I've seen people do that, not that I've ever done that, or maybe, maybe once. But that, that's the thought here, it's like, I don't want to know it, because if I know it, then I'm responsible to do it. And God says, be careful as you hear the word of God, because you're responsible. The positive side is the more you put it into practice, the more he'll make it clear to us in the future and, and as we grow. And, and that the more that we have, the more we have the privilege of sharing with others. And that's part of the fruit. I, I think there are a lot of ways you can try to understand the fruit in the parable we looked at last week uh, about the seed and the sower and the soils. But part of the fruit is the idea that we have something that now we can share with others. Because, you know, when you have a crop, I'm not a farmer, I might even be saying this wrong, but you get seeds out of it, and you can use those seeds and plant more. Isn't that right? And, and that's the idea here is when, when we start bearing fruit, it means that we'll have something to share to, with other people. And then they will be the fruit, and they'll be able to share with other people. But on the other hand, if we don't respond to the little truth that we've been given, we'll not only forfeit more wisdom and understanding, but even what we have won't benefit us. Boy, there's a lot of people that have a lot of head knowledge. They have a lot of information about the Bible. But if they're not putting into practice, it, it isn't bearing fruit. It, it isn't attaining what God's planned desire and purpose is for it. And so the application thought is we can't just hear God's word, we must also do it. James 1.22 says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. If you remember that passage, he goes on to talk about it. It's like a man that looks in a glass or looks in a mirror and he sees himself and, 
maybe he sees that he, he's got mustard on his nose or something, and he just leaves. He doesn't do anything about it. And, they, and, he, and he says, that's deceiving yourself. As we look into God's word, and it is a reflection of how we're living, or maybe things we need to correct, or things that we need to change, or maybe even thought patterns, the way we look at life need to be shifted. But we just walk away and don't do anything. We're deceiving ourselves. We're not really hearing. We're not really taking it in. And so as we know the truth, we can share it with other people. But, but we can't give out what we haven't first taken in. You've got to take it in. You've got to let it root in you. You've got to think about it. You've got to meditate on it. You've you got to go over it. And that's one of the reasons why um, I put the outlines and put the reflections questions in, in the bulletin. Is So it won't be risking your memory. Because if you're like me, I can not only hear a message and forget it, I can preach a message and forget it. Um, that's easy for us to do. And so we need tools. We need things that will help remind us, of whether it's memorizing Scripture or questions that we can review or looking back on our outline, hopefully, most importantly, going back to the passage and reading it over during the week. That helps it sink in. That helps it take root. One thing also that's important is to understand that because God's word is like a lamp, it is a light, those things that we struggle to understand today will one day be made clear. God will bring it into the light and, and we'll understand better. Um, you know, this may be later on in life. Any of you ever have a question or a problem or a struggle and then a few years down the road you say, I understand. It's like the light bulb goes on, right? That you think, you know, I struggled with that for so long, and now I understand what God's purpose was for that in my life. But unfortunately, not all of our questions will be answered in this life. But they will when we get to heaven, when we become like Christ, when we see him as he is. And then in verses 26 to 29, we can depend upon God for the growth of his kingdom as we faithfully share his word. Verses 26 to 29. The kingdom of God is like this. He said, a man scatters seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day. The seed sprouts and grows, although he doesn't know how. The soil produces a crop by itself, first the blade, then the head, and then the full grain on the head. As soon as the crop is ready, he sends for the sickle because... The harvest has come. That, I think the main thought here is that we can do our part, we can sow the seed, we can get ready for the harvest, but we must rely upon him for results. And I'm wondering if that's what the disciples were thinking. As there's begun a shift in Jesus' ministry, that as he's preaching to the masses and, and teaching the crowds, and some people are coming just because of what they could get whether it's a healing or a, a, a demon cast out or, or something else, maybe even, you know, food that he could give them. They're wondering, what's happening here? We're not seeing harvests. We're not seeing a lot of fertile soil. And Jesus is saying, you know, it's not up to you. You need to do your part, but it's God who is the one who's going to bring the results the farmer plants and harvests, but it's not involved in the growth of the plant. I was talking to Bryson this week, and I was sharing with him a little bit about what I was going to be preaching on, and he said, you know what you might want to say, though? At least that's true with dry land farming, that, that you know, you're not involved in it. You just kind of let it happen. I, I guess with irrigated, you got a lot of work that you're doing in the process that's helping it grow. But my guess is they didn't have irrigated farming back then. And so the thought here is you plant it and then you don't know. You don't know what's going to happen. It's up to God. The secret of the harvest is not in the hands of the farmer, but it's dependent upon the life within the seed. That he's saying here, it's the seed, and inherently what's in the seed, which is the word of God, is what produces the growth. And it talks about it as it... Uh, as he's describing, first the blade, then the head, then the full grain on the head. That there's this process of growth, and a lot of it's invisible. Um, and the same is true 
in the kingdom of God. And as I was working on the sermon, I thought, you know what, I, I think I ought to pause here and explain a little bit about the kingdom of God, because that could be misunderstood. The kingdom of God referred to in these parables is speaking of the coming of Jesus as the promised Messiah King. And, and when he first came, his first coming, he didn't set up his earthly physical kingdom. But he did offer himself, offer himself as the king, and the people rejected him. And he offered himself then as the sacrificial savior who would come to rule in the hearts of those who accepted him. But later he would come again. That's his second coming and reign on earth as the king from Jerusalem in the millennium. So the form of God's kingdom in these parables refers to individuals hearing the gospel, opening their hearts to the rule of Jesus in their lives. And we're still in that time. We're still in that time period between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. And so the kingdom we're experiencing is a spiritual kingdom as it's growing among those that would put their faith in Jesus Christ. And you know what? I think one of the lessons from this parable is, you know, we can learn to share the gospel, and we should. And we can learn uh, different techniques of how to share with our family and friends and classmates and neighbors and coworkers, but really we're dependent upon the Holy Spirit to move in a person's heart to convict them of sin and convict them of, of their need of the Savior. We can't force them to believe. Um, I remember when I was in, in college, um, I had a soul-winning class. And that's a term that we don't even use very much. But the guy that taught it, um, he said, you know what? There's a difference between sharing your faith and soul-winning. And he was real excited. And he is one of these guys that would give you all these hints. And he's... One of those guys I used to hate come to my door because he'd say if people would close the door, you put the, your foot in the door. And I thought, man, I don't know how effective that is. But he called it techniques to close the deal. Because he goes, some people share their faith and some people are soul winners. And to be a soul winner, you've got to close the deal. And you know, I, I think what I've learned is um, maybe there are some things to learn from that, but I'm not going to depend on that. Because that's not what brings people to Christ. It's the Holy Spirit working through the gospel, working in their heart that's going to move them. Not the technique I've learned. Not, you know, being obnoxious and sticking my foot in the door, you know, um, those kinds of things. The life-changing power, it's not in our methods. It, it's in the seed. It's in the gospel. It's in the gospel itself. So we just need to be faithful. Faithful to put out the seed to share the gospel. One application then, to lead others to Christ, we can pray and share the truth, but we, we must depend upon God for the results. And you know, one of the things that really kind of has relieved me of the pressure in sharing the gospel is that someone once told me, we're not called to be successful in evangelism, but we're called to be faithful. Because again, it's not up to us whether the person is going to respond. It's up to them. It's up to God working in their life. And then in verses 30 to 32, we can depend upon God to build his kingdom throughout the world, even from small beginnings. And this is a, another parable. It's the parable of the mustard seed. He says, and he said, what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable can we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed that when sown upon the soil is the smallest of all seeds on the ground. And when sown, it comes up and grows taller than all the garden plants and produces large branches so that the birds of the sky can rest in its shade. Uh, the picture there, I don't know if you can even see it, but the guy has a mustard seed on the tip of his finger, and it's just a little dot. And the mustard seed was the smallest seed known to Jesus' audience. But according to what I read, it could grow up to 12 feet high and have a stem the size of a man's arm. Um, it was large enough to have birds rest in it. And so what Jesus was saying with this parable is that, you know, you might think that, you know, all of, all of the sharing that you're doing, all of the preaching that I'm doing, Jesus is saying, you, you might say, well, what effect is it having? The kingdom of God doesn't seem to be growing very fast. Well, he wanted to assure them. 
that indeed it was. That God's new covenant kingdom, beginning with Jesus and just a few of his followers, will grow into a kingdom of people from every tribe, every nation, and every language. There's some debate on what the birds mean. Um, probably the birds mean non-Jewish people and nations that become part of this, this kingdom. So the application thought is don't get discouraged by the external measures of a ministry or ministry success. I remember in seminary we joke about what's a successful ministry. Well, in certain denominations, it's the three B's. Uh, big budgets, big buildings, and big buses. And if you have those things, then you're successful. And if you don't, you're not. Uh, one of the things, when I was in my, my first church, I was a small, small church near San Francisco. We'd average about 30 people. And I remember I'd go to these pastor's conferences, and rather than being encouraged, I was discouraged. Because you know why? First question when a pastor meets you is, well, how big is your church? You know? And if your church is 500, it's like, man, you're, you're worth talking to. But if your church is 30 or 50 or whatever, you know, I got other important people that I need to visit with. But God says, don't get caught up in the external measures of ministry because my kingdom begins small and grows large. You know, almost every great revival began with a few. One of those that I'd heard about um, was called the Christian Businessman's Revival in New York City in 1857. And a layman named Jeremiah Lamphere asked God what he would have him to do. So he started a prayer meeting for businessmen at noon at his church. And it started with just six people. And it began to spread, and soon they had 40. And it began to spread more, and they began not meeting weekly, but meeting daily. Eventually, Dozens and dozens of churches opened their doors at noon for these prayer meetings, and eventually over a million people were saved as a direct result. Started small. Started with one man with a burden asking God what he should do. Some of you remember Promise Keepers. Uh, Promise Keepers was really big in the 90s, and it started with a conversation between two men, Coach Bill McCartney and his friend Dave Wardell. And the first event had uh, 4,200 men in Boulder, Colorado in 1991. And by 1997, a million men met in Washington, D.C. And at the close of 2000, it was reported that 5 million men had attended 100 conferences. With the result, the saving of many souls, marriages saved, families restored, and strengthened. I don't know if you know this, but... Our men's ministry began out of the Promise Keepers movement. I remember it was a conversation that some of us had coming back from a, a Promise Keepers event that we wanted to start meeting together. And I know one of them was Terrell, and I can't remember all the others, but it started with about three or four of us. And um, what a blessing that's been. One of the most wonderful things about our, our church fellowship for me has been our men's ministry. And, and part of it is because it's unique. There aren't a lot of churches that have a strong men's ministry. A lot of churches have wonderful children's programs and women's programs and, and music programs, but very few have really strong men's ministries. And it starts small. That's how God's kingdom is. It's like a mustard seed that starts small. But don't you forget, it'll grow up into this big tree just like God's kingdom continues to grow. And then lastly, as followers of Christ, we can depend upon God to help us understand his word, even though it might be confusing to the world. Verse 33, he was speaking the word to them with many parables like these, as they were able to understand. He did not speak, them without a parable, speak to them without a parable. Privately, however, he explained everything to his own disciples. Jesus used these parables to whet the appetite of those who are willing to receive. Uh, it caused them to want more. It, it made them want to come back and listen. And the question is, what's your appetite like? Are you hungry for God's word? Do you want to learn more? Well, start by putting into practice what you know. Then continue to grow by depending upon him to help you 
understand. This morning we're going to close our service by celebrating the Lord's table or communion together. And in doing so, we're identifying ourselves with Jesus Christ as our Savior and King. And one of the things about being a disciple of Christ is to be obedient. And communion is something that he had asked us to do. He instructed his followers to remember him in this way. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This morning, we're going to celebrate together the Lord's table or communion. And before we do, Scripture uh, invites us or actually commands us to examine our own hearts. And so I'm going to give you some time to examine your heart to make sure that you've indeed um, trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and that you're walking in fellowship with him, and that you know that your sins are forgiven. And it's not because of what you've done or the good works or the religious things that, that you've performed, but it's solely because of Jesus Christ. So let's take a moment, bow our heads, examine our hearts before the Lord before we partake of communion. Lord, we thank you that you've given us a, a physical, tangible reminder of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and what he's done for us. And so, Lord, as we consider the, the wafer, the bread, helping us remember his body and his life, and then also the cup of juice reminding us of his shed blood for us, may it not be just something we know in our head, but something that we've allowed to take root in our lives and that because we know this is true because we know that Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead we can know that he is our Lord and Savior that we we do follow him that we do desire not only to to know him and to know his word but be able to share that as well with others and we give you thanks in Jesus name Amen If you tear off the top layer you should be able to get to the wafer Jesus broke the bread and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me let's remember our Lord Jesus Christ Lord we thank you so much for coming to this earth to live amongst us to live as one of us, yet without sin. To teach and instruct us, to demonstrate the signs that authenticated who you are and what your ministry was about, but then willingly going to the cross to pay the penalty that we deserve for our sin, and then to be raised from the dead. We thank you again for your life on this earth, and we look forward to your coming again in Jesus' name. Amen. In the same way, you took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Again, if you just pull the seal back, let's remember our Lord Jesus Christ and his blood shed for us. Father, once again, we're reminded that we don't save ourselves, that uh, we don't look to how good we are, but we look to Jesus. And we thank you for the costly payment that his shed blood was.
on our behalf. In his name we pray. Amen. And in closing, let's sing song number 549, Face to Face. Let's all stand together as we sing. Thank you.